Uh, Claudia, if you want to continue letting people in for me, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with our introduction as we start letting more of our guests in. So good evening and welcome everybody. I am Valerie Peacock, the Clarice and Robert H. Smith educator at the National Sporting Library Museum. To our members and our board members who are joining us tonight, thank you for your continued support of our mission, exhibitions, and educational programs. To those of you who have not heard of us before, a very big welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, the NSLM is a special collection library and fine art museum dedicated to the preservation of and education about traditional turf and field sports, including wing shooting, angling, and equestrian pursuits, as well as advocating for the conservation of landscape, open space, and waterways integral to these activities. We make our home here in Middleburg, Virginia, but we're a nationally focused institution with visitors, members, and program participants like tonight joining us from all over the country and internationally. We invite you to come out and view our current exhibitions, Walter Mattia Field Notes, and our newly rotated collection highlight galleries. On November 12th, our newest exhibitions, 2020 Hindsight, 40 Years of the American Academy of Equine Arts, and Black Jockeys and the Rise of Jim Crow, a focused museum gallery in tandem with tonight's program, will be on view. These exhibitions will also be available virtually in December. So before I introduce our panelists, I just want to go over a few housekeeping details. Tonight's program is a panel discussion and we have quite a bit of people who will be joining us. So throughout the program, if you have a question, please type that in the chat function on Zoom directly to the NSLM host. Right now you're probably in full screen and so I'll go over real quick how to get to the chat. Just hover up on your top toolbar. You'll see a green screen and next to it view options. Click the little drop down menu and press exit full screen. From there, you'll be able to see both the chat and the presentation. I'm gonna be on the back end of this program tonight. I'll be collecting all the, all the questions and I'll also be on hand to help you with any technical assistance if you need it. This program is also being recorded and a private YouTube link will be available about a week after the program to you. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists real quick. So Professor Kenneth Goings is a professor emeritus in the Department of African-American and African Studies at the Ohio State University. Professor Goings is a graduate of Kent State University and received both his MA and PhD at Princeton University. He joined the African American and African Studies programs at The Ohio State University in 2011 and served as the chair until 2008. He specializes in 19th and 20th century African American history and his research interests include the history of historically black colleges and universities the history of African Americans in post emancipation South, African American popular culture, and African American urban history. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, doing a lot of talking already. <laughs> Professor Goings is the author of NAACP, Comes of Age, The Defeat of Judge John J. Parker, which received the Outstanding Book Award on the subject of human rights, <clears throat> Mammy and Uncle Moses, Black Collectibles and the American Stereotyping, which also received the same award in 1994 and co-edited the Raymond Mole, the African-American Urban History. Goings is the author of numerous articles, essays, book chapters, and book reviews. He's lectured extensively on black collectibles and modern phase of civil rights movement, the history of black colleges and universities. In 2001, he was appointed the distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians and his current research project with Eugene O'Connor is they dare to call their souls their own, the classics as a tool of resistance and social uplift. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to take a sip of my water because that was a really long biography, <laughs> Dr. Goings. <laughs> okay, next, uh, Mary Thompson. She's a research historian at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Ms. Thompson has been a member of the staff at George Washington's Mount Vernon for over 41 years where she's gone from giving tours to 8,000 people a day, managing the curatorial collection, and now as a research historian. Ms. Thompson has curated the traveling exhibition, Treasures from Mount Vernon, George Washington Revealed, and has worked to ensure that the enslaved community at Mount Vernon is remembered. In 2009, she received the Alexandria History Award from the Alexandria Historical Society and the George Washington Memorial Association Award in 2013. She is author of In the Hands of Good Providence, Religion and the Life of George Washington, a short biography of Martha Washington, and the only avoidable subject of regret, George Washington, Slavery and the Enslaved Community at Mount Vernon. <clears throat> the last book received the James Bradford Best Biography Prize 
for the Society of Historians and the Early American Republic in 2020. <laughs> Carol Grissom is a senior objects conservator at the Smithsonian Institution. Ms. Grissom graduated with a BA um, from Wesley College and an MA from Oberlin College. Grissom's research and specialities and interests are in the technical study and conservation treatment of plaster, stone, and metal artifacts with special attention to sculpture. Grissom's research activities have included the technical study and historical research into the Greek statuettes and the technical study and conservation treatment of ancient plaster statues. Um, Grissom has been recognized for her work in the field as the J. Paul Getty Paired Fellow for Research and Conservation and the History of Art and Archaeology at the Center for Study of Visual Arts, National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. She's also the author of several academic articles and the book Zinc Sculpture in America, 1850 to 1950. She's a member of the International Institute for Conservation, the American Institute for Conservation, and the International Council of Museums and the D.C. Association for Preservation Technology. And last but not least, we have our moderator tonight, Claudia Pfeiffer, the deputy director and George L. Orstrom Jr. curator at the National Sporting Library and Museum. Pfeiffer has an almost 30 year background in fine art and exhibitions and has been with the NSLM since 2012. In addition to her administrative duty duties, Pfeiffer focuses on research, design, interpretation, writing and installation of loan and permanent collection exhibitions. She's curated over 30 exhibitions and counting and she has had several essays published, including her most recent work, Ellen Emmett Rand, Artist and Equestrian, in the book, Ellen Emmett Rand, Gender, Art, and Business. With all that being said, I'm gonna to turn tonight's program over to our moderator. Please remember, you can add questions in the chat throughout the program. Hey, welcome to Myth Busting Lawn Jockeys, Untangling History from Lore. So, Thank you for joining us this evening. The idea for this program developed from research on an iron jockey that was donated to the National Sporting Library and Museum in 2019. I was aware of the three models we will be discussing as having originally been manufactured as hitching posts. Over the years, I've come across many of these vintage and antique decorative objects and was aware of the fascinating narratives that surround them. In delving into their manufacturing history, however, their production timelines began to unravel these stories. I also came across our panelists this evening and other scholars who independently were coming to the same conclusions. And it seemed like a wonderful opportunity to coordinate this roundtable and discuss these findings. Shown here are three models referred to as hitching posts, iron jockeys, and lawn jockeys that we will be examining today. Ms. Grissom, what was the state of American cast iron and zinc production that led to the casting of the first hitching posts? And what has your research into these materials led you to conclude about the production timeline? And do either of you have additional thoughts about this when she finishes? Um, one of the, uh, the, the statue that you see on the left um, has a, a mark of the company Wood and Perot out of Philadelphia. And uh, it's believed that it was uh, executed uh, based on the design uh, or based on a model created by uh, Thomas Holcomb. It was, I think it was Thomas, um, uh, Mr. Holcomb anyway, uh, that was given to uh, Wooden Perot probably uh, around 1860. Or, or maybe a little before that. Uh, Mr. Holcomb then died in 1862 and gave uh, the, uh, allowed Wooden Pro to continue um, producing them. Uh, they were subsequently produced by um, uh, both statues by uh, J.W. Fisk, which was a, was a large um, fountain manufacturer um, out of New York, New York City. Um, they appear in an 1874 uh, catalog of J.W. Fisk uh, in, in zinc, although uh, Fisk also sold them in cast iron and eventually obtained the rights to them. Um, the statue on the right, uh, I have uh, not actually seen a copy of, and, and I, so I, I, uh, I, I will cede all information about that one to someone else. 
Dr. Gongs, do you have any thoughts about that third one as a general overview for dating it? Uh, my suggestion uh, earlier, my thoughts earlier on this, was that it probably is from the uh, 19, early 1900s, 19 teens. I mean, the bright color of the red and the blue uh, and the black, uh, the black face. I would put it there in the early part of the uh, 20th century. Uh, by the farther on into the latter, the middle of the 20th century, say the 40s and 50s, the colors would have been more muted. Uh, and, these, and these are pretty bright. So that's my best estimate about, about this one. I wasn't terribly familiar with this myself either. So in generalities, I, I what these, a, oh, sorry. I didn't have a question. I've been, um, for uh, Ms. Grissom, um, it was, in terms of these, is there any information on production numbers? So I just wondered how many of these were made. I mean, and it becomes important later when I think about how many of these were left at different different points at a time. Do you have any idea how much, how many of these were made in say the 19th century or even the 20th century? Uh, I, I, I don't have any idea. I, my uh, interest was really in zinc sculpture. So I was mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. uh, looking to count the zinc sculptures and, and, and there are not very many copies of, of either the jockey or the, the statue on the left, which was called alternately Sambo or Dark. Yeah. Um, and I, I know several copies of in zinc of both of those statues. Uh, and I've by chance uh, uh, seen a lot of the cast iron ones. I, I, I think I'm, I'm certain there are many more of the cast iron ones out there. Um, but I, 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 I never uh, counted those. Um, I, as I was looking uh, to see what uh, uh, zinc statues there might be, I, I encountered many, many. The, the, there, are, there are probably there were probably about thirty of the jockeys on the Twenty One Club right there, mm -hmm. um, and there were uh, many others that I would uh, look at and determine were not zinc, but rather cast iron that I encountered in my research. Um, nope. they weren't kidding. they weren't they weren't numbered in any edition sizes um so i i'd like to tackle this next question from the direction of the the definition of these objects as first hitching posts iron jockeys and lawn jockeys what do you see as the distinctions are you asking me <laughs> if you'd like to jump in on this um question to start it that'd be great uh, well, obviously the uh, the cast iron ones were would be the only ones that could serve as hitching posts because you need something heavy enough that could could hold a horse. Um, I uh, understand that that uh, the the ones that were used for zinc were were often called signs. They would uh, put them on a on a uh, a rolling platform and and. Uh, move them out of a shop to indicate what the shop ha uh, had. Um, and then, of course, uh, rolled back inside at night. And uh, those are sort of like a, a very similar to a tobacco store Indian uh, in usage. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I, I haven't. Uh, focused on that on that terminology maybe somebody else would like to jump in in, in the sporting collecting world um, they tend to be referred to as iron jockeys um, uh, my experience has been um, historically that lawn jockeys tends to look more towards the decorative objects that would have been circulated more widely in a in, in a suburban environment on the lawn um, and they, they would be usually made in concrete and seeing those post World War II. Dr. Goings, does that kind of fit with some of the things you've seen? Yes, except that I, I also haven't been very specific about the different the different types. I really see them all. I see them all as as sort of lawn jockeys, without 
making the differentiation between them, which is easier for me to view them that way and to look at the stereotypes they're, they're portraying as opposed to their function. Okay. So now that we've clarified a little bit more about what these objects are that we're talking about, um, let's uh, dive into some of these myths that we and, and stories that we'd like to untangle today. The first myth we'll be examining is the origin story at Mount Vernon. Ms. Thompson, what is the Mount Vernon myth and when did this myth first arise? I don't know when it first arose. <laughs> um, and um, this, the story goes back to the Revolutionary War, the night of uh, Christmas 1776, when George Washington and the army crossed from the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River to the New Jersey side of the Delaware River um, as they were heading in to surprise the British at Trenton on Christmas morning. Um, the story is that there was a 12 year old boy um, who was the son of an arm, army teamster um, who um, was asked to hold the horses for the officers on the Pennsylvania side until they came back the following day after the, or, or whenever, um, after the, the battle. Um, his, the little boy's name was supposedly Jocko Graves. Um, so he was left holding the horses on the Pennsylvania side of the river. Um, the night, as everybody knows, was very cold and icy um, and, and he froze to death um, before the battle had taken, before the people had gotten back from the, the battle. Um, he froze to death holding the, the reins of the horses that he'd been left to take care of. Um, George Washington was said to be so moved by his steadfastness that he um, ordered a statue to be made um, of, of the, the young man and then um, have it placed at Mount Vernon. Um, <laughs> we, we've investigated this story. Um, as has the staff at Washington's Crossing who have an even bigger stake in it and found nothing to substantiate the story. Um, there also, um, the, the other thing that you have to take in mind at Mount Vernon is that there are no records of any sculptures being um, commissioned by George Washington for Mount Vernon. Um, the only piece of what you could call sculpture is the Dove of Peace, which is the weather vane on top of the um, on top of the cupola, which is the sort of tower like structure in the middle of the roof on the Mount Vernon mansion. Um, we know that Washington, we have paperwork documenting that Washington commissioned this piece in the summer of 1787 when he was in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. And he asked that um, architect, Philadelphia architect Joseph Rakestraw um, uh, to design the, the Dove of Peace um, and then send it to, to Mount Vernon. Um, so it's interesting as he was at the Constitutional Convention when they're setting up the new government and what life is sort of going to be like in the in the new country and um and he's also contemplating the completion of the mansion because his, this is one of the last bits to finishing the construction of the mansion um he he's thinking about peace and um yeah it, it's it's the only um sculpture that that washington commissioned for the mansion or for the for the estate and so going back to that idea of looking at these two um, pitching posts that sometimes are referred to as being of Jocko Graves, um, the one on the, in the center specifically, historically, possibly having been that lore with Mount Vernon. Um, what um, you've already sort of addressed the, the idea of them as an apocryphal concept. Um, is there, in light of what you've said, really, do you see any evidence that there could be any truth to something having been done that wasn't documented? 
no, I don't, or yeah, I don't think there's any truth to it. Um, and following on that idea, um, looking at the manufacturing timelines, if we go back to Ms. Grissom about the um, the first manufacturing of that one in the middle there, um, that date, um, if you could remind us again, would be where would that one have started? Um, uh, that date. It's probably late 1850s right? or early 1860s. Yeah. So it, it is fascinating in terms of how, um, how these um, stories converge around the myths here. And they are, they're certainly celebratory. I should, I should just say that myth is just so incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. And it's still with us, no matter how much you <laughs> talk to people about it. And I was telling my barber about this program. And he was actually not only shocked, he was a little bit hurt that I didn't believe that uh, this was done by George Washington from Mount, from, Mount, from Mount Vernon. He really was that deeply invested in, and a lot of African-Americans for some reason, particularly our, particularly this one, um, in the belief that George Washington, the father of the country, did it, and it was to it was a sign of the praise of African-American. And that's just so deeply held. I'm not sure if there's anything you can do to change people's minds, a lot of people's minds on this one. Well, I read that there were um, um, at least two books, maybe more, and they may have been sort of, sort of, that were written um, about this story, possibly for children. So mm -hmm. this is something that, you know, you know, mom read it to to this person as a as a kid or something and it, and it um it really struck home and you know i heard it was a kid you know when i was a kid then i read it in a book so it must be true you know <laughs> um, and, and i even given interviews over the years in association with my, my collectibles book and we'll talk about this image and i'll even make i'll even tell the reporter the person that's interviewing me that i believe it's an apocryphal story but for some reason when people read it they believe that I'm supporting it. And I, <laughs> and I still get emails from people thanking me, thanking me for recognizing uh, George Washington's contribution and how favorable <laughs> this is. That's no lie. That's just how strong this one is. Yeah. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm unclear. Is, is the Jocko story, Jocko Grace story associated with uh, the particular statue that's in the middle of, of the screen, or or is it the other uh, the, the other jockey statue? The middle, for, the or not, or not none of the above. It's the middle really one's the closest yeah. to what the jocko. I think the jocko would have been. Uh huh. Well, but one, one on thing right that side. I notice is that uh, he's standing on a bale of cotton, which wouldn't make any sense uh, related <laughs> to George Washington. Yeah. And so the one on the right um, was associated with Jocko Graves by the 1970s. There was a pamphlet that had this particular model on the front cover that was um, describing the story of Jocko Graves. Uh, so moving forward to the idea of that, um, one of the other things that's really fascinating um, discussion point that comes up with this first model that we've been talking about is the idea that they would have been distributed um, extensively and used during the um, as a, a silent signaling system for the Underground Railroad. And I'd like to um, ask you all to share your understanding of the lore that surrounds that. Dr. Goins, maybe you'd like to start with that one. Well, I mean, it's, I think that's even weaker than the Jocko. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, it, that these were uh, posts put out on the Underground Railroad and to in front of houses that would be safe houses. You know, from, I just very quickly, from 1793 to 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act required that the master himself go to try and recapture his slaves. And there weren't that many who were actually going to come north to, um, uh, recapture their, uh, their enslaved people. But in the 1850s, in the second uh, Fugitive Slave Act, masters were able to hire bounty hunters 
uh, often local police, local sheriffs, to go north to look for their uh, ex escaped uh, people, people from their plantation. And these bounty hunters were professional people catchers who made their living doing this. Now, if the slaves and the conductors could see these outside, why wouldn't the bounty hunters be able to and just and just be waiting for the uh, uh, slaves to uh, to show up on these sites where they had these these uh, objects standing there. Uh, in addition, I have read dozens, <laughs> but not not ex not exhaustively. I've read dozens of, of biographies and autobiographies from the uh, enslaved people who had escaped and from the uh, conductors who took them north and never once, never once is there mention of these statues. One of the things I was reading was that um, people would, the, the people having the safe houses would put like a green ribbon um, on the statue if it was safe to come in and a red one if it was not safe. And I thought, how easy would that code have been to break, you know? And um, it, you could read the same things about quilt patterns, um, you know? Yes. And that's been pretty, that myth has been pretty well debunked too. Um, but the, it's interesting that people put, put these things on these objects. <laughs> and, and the thing about the ribbons, the red ribbons and the uh, green ribbons, I was reading some more about those. Uh, those that signaling came with the uh, may have come with the railroad, the railroad signals, and okay. but even that was in the 1870s, after the <laughs> after the end of slavery. So, um, yeah, there was just this <laughs> attempt to to find some value uh, mm -hmm. in this and not accept them for what they were, or at least what I think they were. I think that some of the manufacturing catalogs pointed to the different, um, you know, marketing concepts that were surrounding what they were called, right? This, you know, the, you can see in the, um, the description G there from the Fisk catalog, it being referred to as the Darkie Hitching Post. And there were other examples of it being called Sambo. Uh, so I, I think that I, I, the, there's a lot of evidence in support of, um, I think, contradicting this. But it's another one, uh, fascinatingly, that people really feel a strong connection to. Okay. So here we have um, the second model that we approached in the introduction here that was first copyright, copyrighted in 1871. Again, 1871 being um, post-Civil War. Uh, Dr. Goings, in the latter quarter of the 19th century, this model sometimes called the Cavalier Spirit rose in distribution. Uh, these objects were popularized in the New South Consumer Society. Why do you not see these types of objects as pervasive beforehand? Uh, basically because they weren't needed beforehand. Uh, these objects, again, are, are part of a myth-making uh, tradition. And in the uh, 1870s on, uh, really, and, and, and really, I think more after the end of Reconstruction, there is the need, the South sees the need to uh, really create this myth of the Old South, New South. And this, this object, this um, hitching post or um, a lantern holder, a jockey, uh, really fits into this myth making. I mean, in, in a sense, it's it's it seems a little bit counterproductive because the image is white. This is this is a white jockey, um, and he is slimmer uh, than a lot of the original black jockeys. He's also he's also taller, um, and uh, this jockey's had a lot of names. This is this image, I should say, has a lot of names. Uh, Cavalier uh, spirit really seems to be, in a sense, more, the most appropriate. Uh, but it's also, he's also been called the groomsman, and he's also sim simply been called uh, the jockey. Now, as part of the Old South, New South myth, what 
the, the white South or parts of the white South was trying to do was to show that they had a special, they, they were on their way to create a special civilization and that this special civilization had been destroyed by those Northerners who had come, um, who had come, who had brought the war uh, to uh, to their to their region, and one of the values of the spatial civilization was the value of honor, truth, and honor. I mean, hence the name the Cavalier, and uh, he is this young man is in a sense the symbol of this this truth uh, and, and honor. Uh, so he. There wasn't a need for this. There wasn't a need to convince the North about who they were before. Uh, at this point, they wanted to convince the North that they uh, were able to take care of race relations on their own, that uh, they knew what they were doing. They were honorable people. Uh, they were trustworthy people. Uh, and if the North would just quit bothering them, um, things, things would be things would, would be fine. Now, this also relates to that first question I was asking about if we had any sense of the numbers of this, because I've talked to other collectors and even a couple of museums that collect uh, African-American collectibles, um, and they really don't have, uh, the collectors haven't really seen an image of the Cavalier from the 19th century. Uh, they, they have seen them uh, really from what they believe to be the mid 20th century uh, and really after World War II. And so, and, and so I, I'm, I'm also not sure how popular these were uh, before uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. I mean, one thing we have, one thing we have to remember is the South was devastated by the war, mm -hmm. uh, and there was very little money in the in the South for a long time. So to find these kind of ornaments in the South, uh, um, I think would be fairly unusual. Uh, and by the early part of the 1870s, 1880s, that Southern myth had not permeated that far north and that permanently. By the 1890s, the North accepts the Southern myth, whole hog, they accepted whole hog. And indeed they want to become part of it. And you see, you can really see a transference of Southern mythology uh, physically and uh, intellectually to the North. And these statues increasingly find their way North. Uh, but that's that's later, a later, a later time. Um, but I just I just find the uh, the Cavalier uh, just just fascinating uh, for that reason. Um, he was very very important in, in putting that myth uh, that myth forward. But again, I think he was more he was more popular after World War II than he was before World War II. But I would be curious to know what the others if they have any knowledge or any views on how popular his image actually was in the 19th century. I think one of the things that's fascinating um, from my perspective and looking at Ms. Grissom's research and the early manufacturing catalogs is the, um, for whom those catalogs were, were published. And I think that when we look at um, the, the, the idea of them as ornaments, a lot of times they would have been um, referenced within the idea of uh, uh, barn fittings or um, um, that particular cultural element. Uh, in looking at that idea, you know, as you mentioned, it the model appears to be uh, referring to um, a fair complexion, where we do see surviving examples of um, some being painted with brown skin as well. Now, the late 19th century is really um, an amazing time period in American horse racing, where we have this uh, contingent of really talented and capable athletic black jockeys who are dominating horse racing in the United States and becoming financially successful, becoming nationally popular um, and having um, a, a really a sense of uh, upward mobility. Uh, we all uh, know the narrative then in terms of the escalation of Jim Crow sentiments. Uh, unfortunately, really, they, they, they drive these jockeys out of American racing by the turn of the 20th century. 
Um, <laughs> would you see connections um, in the increase of distribution of the Cavalier jockey style with the sporting world in the latter quarter of the 19th century and into the 20th? Yes, to that, to, that, to that extent. Uh, and I think it's important to note about that, that exclusion that's taking place, that indeed, you, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of things that are taking place. There are owners who want their horses to win. And then some of the jockeys obviously were, were excellent uh, groomsmen, uh, jockeys, and they, could, they, were, they were winning races. At the same time, you have a political movement that is bound, at particularly the end of the 19th century, it's bound and determined to make sure that African Americans are not equal. Um, and since they are not equal, they also should not have the vote. And to praise African Americans for their any kind of winning ability when they can beat, particularly if they can beat uh, white jockeys, uh, is just to defeat this whole thing trying to take the vote away from them and trying to make them uh, appear to be inferior. Um, so I see that, yeah, I see that movement uh, taking place going along with the, I see the political movement overriding the sporting movement uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. Um, and that again, I don't know, it, it still leaves me wondering more about this cavalier spirit. I'd like to, I'd just like to know more about what's behind uh, the design of, of, that, of that figurine. It's not a figurine I'm really that familiar with. Well, this, for, this particular one within the sporting world historically um, has been one that uh, sometimes would literally be repainted to, to match a particular um, owner's silks and mm -hmm. uh, in, in presentation. So we do see them in sporting culture collected as vintage and antique objects that way. And when, so, and when they are painted with the only sporting cultures, what's the face painted? The face white, brown, black, or all, uh, it all the above? It, it varies. Okay. I mean, I did read about them being at the 21 Club and uh, those sorts of things, but yeah, I'd just like to know more about the Cavalier uh, spirit. Oh. Uh, I'd be curious to know if anybody in Middleburg uh, knows exactly how uh, how the the, the statue. Uh, apparently, Paul Mellon, for example, racing silks, uh, and his name are uh, were on one of the statues at the Twenty One Club. And did he donate that statue? Uh, how, how did that? Does anybody know how that happened? Uh, in the Middleburg community, I would I would think there might be others uh, uh, that are other people that are represented from Middleburg. They were um, my from what I know tangentially. They uh, they were part of the aesthetic of the Twenty One Club, and they were repainted in two thousand fifteen. They were deinstalled and they were repainted and in installed again. Um, and it was it, they do re reference um, different winning jockeys and stables. But without any uh, actual connection to the owners, I think in celebration of the of the um, some highlights. Uh -huh. So, this third model is intriguing, and in the idea that um, it again is one that's referred to as the sambo jockey, and seems to have really gained um, footing in the 1920s. Um, would you take a moment, please, to uh, expand on the changes you see in the broader context of black collectible, collectibles, manufacturing, and consumerism from the 1920s through to the 1950s? And how do you think that relates to this model? One of the, one of the things that's happening, uh, really, starting really after World War I um, and, and moving forward, is there is an increasing black insurgency. And this black insurgency is sort of pushing back against that old South, new South myth, which is still around. I mean, and obviously uh, it's still very, very strong. Hence the great success of uh, Gone with the Wind uh, and, and, and all of that. So it's still very, and still in the North, so very, very strong in the North. So, but there is an increasing black insurgency pushing back against that. Uh, and these objects 
uh, I see as an attempt to uh, show African Americans as, in a sense, comical, um, miniature human beings, uh, not serious, but very, but also very importantly, still happy to be working for the master. It's as if the old slaves are still around uh, in the guise of these new uh, these new workers, uh, and then I think it's just as a reflection again of how strong that. Um, that, that myth making uh, Old South, New South uh, really is. Although, there, again, there is a, a, a pushback, there's increasing pushback by African Americans. But you can see these are, these are, these are caricatures. I don't, you know, I, um, so. One of the things I found intriguing about the earliest iterations of this third model is that it falls into the same category of hitching post. And as a cast iron object that's being manufactured, they weren't cheap, right? If we look yeah, at what they yeah. what they cost in in, in comparable terms, um, looking at the Fisk catalog and the um, Dale Mott catalog pricing, to have one cast comparably would have been about twelve hundred dollars today in today's concepts. Right. So looking at those early ones that are cast iron, that they're really sort of falling into a decorative objects collecting corner as opposed to sort of a broader collectibles corner. And that transition into um, concrete pouring after World War II, where these things then become eminently more accessible to a broader um, a variety of people to have as objects decorating their, their properties. Um, and on that idea, then looking at this over the timeline, by whom and for whom were they made? made by white people for white people. I mean, that's the thing that, that we often keep forgetting. Uh, and it's often that, that in, even today still, uh, people think that somehow African-Americans made these or they were made for a black audience. No, um, they were made by white people uh, for white people because it also, was also important as part of the whole racial ideology uh, that's being created in the United States, that white people remember who they are. Uh, and part of that ideology is that they're, they're there to remember that um, they, are, they are better than these people. They are better than the people portrayed in these objects. Uh, and it's easy to see, it's easy to imagine yourself as better than these, uh, these little guys. So that, and that helps reinforce whiteness also because Again, as that black insurgency comes comes along, uh, it's trying to knock down notions of whiteness, and these uh, images are trying to reinforce it uh, by showing that African Americans and white people are not the same, they're not equal, and that black people are different and inferior. That's how I see it. So one of the things I also found really intriguing in researching the different models um, and the different manufacturers, because there are extensive catalog records that you, Dr. Goings, and you, Ms. Grissom, have delved into extensively um, over the course of the 19th century into the mid-20th century. And the, the, a lot of the other two models also bear casting marks and manufacturers and makers references so that they can be tracked back to when they might have been produced or by whom. Where in the examples that exist of these, they do not seem to have any manufacturer's marks on them. There's no um, traceable trade catalog records to the, um, the, the uh, um, marketing of them, as we saw with the other um, early advertisements that we showed with the other slides. Um, what are your thoughts on this discrepancy, um, and especially as these were mainstream consumer products? Um. I, I, this is beyond my uh, expertise, I'm afraid. So, do you find it striking that um, they, they obviously they exist, but that there isn't a company that um, really took a, a, a printed marketing approach to making them? I don't find that unusual because isn't there isn't there a point in time in which marketing and it really is more toward the end of the 19th century that marketing becomes a bigger deal. Uh, and that uh, earlier there was, you know, there was a craft movement in the United States and people 
did crafts and they may have been, uh, may have done it without, without actually having branded um, and tried to advertise on a larger scale. I don't find that, I don't find that particularly unusual. I think that to me, that would go along with the whole, aver the, the whole creation of advertising and marketing. It does it becomes more sophisticated as we move along. And the earlier ones were more, were more open and, and unidentified. I would, I, that's how I was, that's my, would be my explanation for those. So Ms. Grissom, one of the things that I, um, is intriguing is that uh, companies like um, um, Fisk and JL Mott, they had the archetype, the production, um, the catalog pages with a certain engraving that they kind of renewed over and over again, where you see the same illustration of the first model we talked about and the second model that we talked about together on one page. And for decades, it's kind of the same, the same page and we never see any deviation from that. Um, the, the production of this third model as a cast iron object, again, it would not have been an inexpensive undertaking. Would you have any thoughts about um, how that might have been um, produced as a cast iron object? You're, you're talking about the, this, the, these three on the screen on the left? Well, and all three versions, let me scroll back. Or all to three all versions. Three. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea that, it, it tell, back your, wait, tell me your exact question again. Sorry. So the, the one that's on the left here and the one that's yeah. in the center, they were often um, uh, in the magazines per, um, shown together as a, uh, options from JL right. um, Mott or from, from Fisk in their, in their catalog pages. And also with, the, uh, notably, there was a, a Chinese figure that was uh, often with them also. Right. No. And so, and the version on the right then is a cast iron object that was, was created within the, the concept of an iron works and the production of it as an iron object would have made it a fairly expensive undertaking in, in my thought, or did that get less expensive to produce by the turn of the 20th century? Well, the big expense is in, in making the original patterns. Uh, once you've got the patterns, uh, they could probably reproduce them pretty inexpensively. Um, they, they, they were, uh, I suspect they were mostly sand cast. Uh, so, you, you, and, and iron, you know, was never expensive, never that expensive. And zinc was even cheaper probably right. because it, it was also easier to put the, the statues together in zinc. Um, I, I, I'm sort of drawing a blank on how to answer your question. <laughs> that, that's, so. that's a great um, um, a reference point for the manufacturing process. So looking at all of the, the models cumulatively, please feel free to jump in um, with your thoughts. Uh, why do the, the objects transition from this impoverished boy to the cavalier and finally to the caricature model? And what does that transition say about American culture in each era? Well, I, I'm still uh, interested in the fact that uh, all the, that all of the images of the of the jockey hitching post uh, in the catalogs are illust are portrayed as white, and then uh, it's it's fascinating to me that that most of the ones that you see then are are portrayed as African-American. Um, and some people say that has to do with the, the rise of uh, black African-American jockeys actually at a certain point. And then more recently uh, there, well, actually there is a, a famous uh, African-American jockey now, but, uh, his, but I gather that at a certain point, the jockey, most jockeys at racetracks were, were white. Um, and I find that kind of uh, anomalous, but anyway. In, in terms of the um, um, racing history until the turn of the 20th century, and especially in that pocket in the last quarter of the 19th century, it was about 50-50 in the top races when you look at, and a lot of them, and the, the Kentucky Derby, the most right. of the fir first races were actually won by, by black jockeys. So there was a really strong contingent of these athletes who were incredibly successful in that era until they were literally pushed out by 
the um, early 20th century with Jim Crow, and they were going to to Europe where they were getting more more attention and um, and and good salaries that they were used to and better publicity. Um, so, but that doesn't really correspond with uh, with when the when how the statues were painted. I think. But yeah, I, I think. I, when we look at the uh, the last the if if we go by what they were um, publicized as in the manufacturing records as a Caucasian jockey, we don't have a lot of records relating to what what the skin tone was or what the race colors were because a lot of times they were repainted and a lot of the surviving examples have several layers of paint, making it even more difficult to even sometimes date when they were originally manufactured. Yeah. So that it adds a lot of layers into being able to discern when this this uh, this idea of painting them either with different skin tones or um, the repainting of the silks, uh, the choices that were made and when. Yeah. Well, okay. Can I say a word or two? Oh, absolutely. Or inappropriate. Well, because you mentioned the first in the beginning, I think it's the first 14 Kentucky Derbies were won by black jockeys who were actually enslaved at that time and riding their way out of slavery with the money that was won for, on behalf of the owner. Thank you for sharing that, Vicki. Appreciate it. So on the idea of um, these objects and uh, us as a uh, professionals in in the uh, in the in the task with the role of interpreting and sharing these objects what do you uh, do we do with these um, objects as professionals as everyday people um, are they worthy of holding in public and private collections and if so why and how should we interpret these objects with respect to their history I I for one think that I strongly hope that they're held in public collections because they are indeed, uh, they give a very, to me, they give a very good representative example of the changing nature of race relations and racial stereotypes in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think they are historical artifacts. They are, they are, witnesses to history. I mean, in, in a sense, they were history makers. Um, so they are worthy of being held uh, and not destroyed. There are many people out there who really feel that the black collectibles and all of these jockeys, hitching posts, et cetera, should be destroyed. But I really think that it will be, would be destroying a history uh, that's important, that's important that we remember. Um, and you can just see the changing nature of race relations and the changing nature of the racial stereotypes about African Americans uh, through these objects. Um, so I think I think it should be held. Ms. Thompson, do you have anything to add? No, I don't think so. Um, I agree very much with with Dr. Goings, and um, that it's important to keep them. Uh, so that people can actually see what those feelings were at the time of, of when they were made. Um, I, yeah, I think that's very important. You say, find the same kind of things with um, Native American artifacts or sort of things made for the white audience, um, focusing on Native Americans. It's the same kind of thing. And if, if, if they aren't around and you just have to just read about them, it's, it's very different than seeing the actual object. Um, the, the, the racism really comes across. Um, and I, I also wanted to say that George Washington at one, um, at one he, he was a big supporter of, of horse races. He subscribed, he the, would, would put in money for the purse at, at, for the winning horse at the end and that kind of thing. Um, at least one of his, um, enslaved horseman uh, is a man named Peter Hardiman, who was rented from a relative. Um, P Peter was lent to William Fairfax, uh, or excuse me, William Fitzhugh, um, 
in about 1786 to ride, um, both, both to take care of and to ride, I think, um, Fitzhugh's horse, whose name was Tarquin, um, who was a, I guess, prominent horse at the time. So they were okay. black jockeys in the 18th century. Thank you for Thank sharing, you that. sharing that. Um, um, Ms. Grissom, Ms. Grissom, do you have any, you have any thoughts, thoughts on, on um, um, public collections for these subjects? Uh, it, it, you're not coming out clearly. I mean, the sound is terrible. Mm. Um, I, I couldn't I understand couldn't the question. question. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. This has been a really fascinating um, exchange and I thank you very much for um, sharing your thoughts um, from your different uh, perspectives. Uh, I've been really intrigued to hear about different specialists um, background and understanding and how these um, objects came to be and um, how they've evolved over time. So I uh, really uh, appreciate your uh, willingness to, to share your thoughts and perspectives uh, in this program. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion because I'm sure we've amassed some great questions and thoughts and maybe even new information to share uh, with the audience. So I am going to turn uh, the uh, discussion over to Valerie to share the different questions that she's received in the question and answer section during the program. Yeah, so we've received quite a few questions. Um, so one question that we had from Donna was, what percentage of homes had these hitching posts, if you know that? Um, and when did lawn jockeys become popular for decoration? And were there any other forms of human lawn jockeys or human uh, forms for lawn decoration that were prevalent around the same time? I think looking at the um, uh, Miss Grissom's early research, that there was a variety of um, fig three three dimensional figures that were um, as these uh, advertisements in zinc. But the the um, in terms of iron jockeys, there were maybe so there was the Chinaman. There are the three that we've talked about, and there was a fifth one that I um, that I'm aware of. How how broadly they were distributed? I think we've we've determined across the discussion that it's difficult to say how widely they were distributed um, and in terms of how many uh, survived. Certainly they are, they're decorative collectibles uh, that come up in the um, antiques market. They're not, you know, it's not a flooded uh, market per se. And, and from what I've gathered, uh, the, the concrete objects, there's really no way to track those as they're, they're you know, if they're tchotchkes at the end of the day, the concrete ones that are post-World post War II. And, and um, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Goins. I was gonna say, what I'm amazed by is they're still selling very, very well. Uh -huh. I mean, I've just gotten lots of emails from uh, people who know places that uh, make them, they uh, make them to order uh, and new ones. And uh, someone, there was a big story about somebody during the pandemic how much money they had made um, creating these uh, concrete versions of these uh, during the pandemic, during the first years of the pandemic. Uh, so they're, they're still continuing and they're out there more. They're out, I don't say more and more. I, I always get a sense that they're less and less and then I come across something where there's, they appear to be more and more. But I am also amazed by how widespread uh, these got to be about 15 years ago, I happened to, to go on vacation to Nova Scotia. Uh, and one of the, in the trip I took on Nova Scotia, other people may have taken it also, is where you uh, drive around basically in a circle around Nova Scotia. Um, and I was just stunned by the amount of, a, a lot of the homes uh, out in the countryside in Nova Scotia had once had water wells. And they, these wells obviously have been covered over since they've gotten modern modern plumbing or modern water systems. And on top of those wells, you would often find what I would call a lawn jockey 
or another piece of black memorabilia. And I just really had no, until I went there, I had no sense about how widespread and how far flung these images had been. I was actually shocked to see them in Nova Scotia, but they're in Nova Scotia also. I'm sure in other parts of Canada probably too. Um, do modern tracks uh, still perpetuate the false myth of the New South or the Old South through the fact that they still utilize these lawn jockeys in public places? I, I don't think that they perpetuate the myth so much as try to tie into that and try to elevate their own status. Um, I think for a time, particularly in the 50s, 60s, uh, with suburbanization in, in the North, I think people who put, a lot of people put these on their yards, saw themselves as improving their status uh, by making that, that association. I would think after the civil rights movement of the late 60s, uh, people who put these on their lawns uh, newly, I think they have to know uh, that it's not improving at least for, Af for other Af African-Americans, I think for a lot of white Americans, they are not improving their status um, because they are, they are demeaning. But I think before the civil rights movement, I think, oh, I think a lot of people thought that they were improving their status uh, by, by having these objects around and in the yard. In the in, yard, in, in the sporting world, so publicly and, and um, looking at privately people who um, have historically displayed these, I think there's a more literal connection to them as and the one in the center is the one that is the one that I came across the most in my my travels um, within a sporting conversation, where they're really they're, 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 they're decorative objects that are part of the landscape and they are, um, they, they have a, a, a positive sort of um, Lore also attached to them in terms of it's a it's really a decorative object that um, again with this idea of repainting them as a, a an annual tradition or to mark particular races or events and historically that uh, it's the I, I understand the broader context of it within the broader collecting world but there is a, sort of this this lane in the middle that is looking at them as a, a celebration of racing heritage and racing history in particular and they're not attaching any per, not per se them as a specific as a, looking at it as a black or a white jockey so much as this is recognizing a particular um race record or um or 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 stable or or owner do you do you know actually how well they function as a hitching post um in fact, I, I, it seems like to me as if the arm might be broken off rather easily <laughs> by, by a large horse. <laughs> Have you ever seen one in use? No, I, I think they're, they're now as vintage and antique collectibles, a lot of times they're, they're designs that are part of um, people's properties. I don't know very much in in terms of them being practically used as, as hitching posts. Um, another person had a question and we've touched on this a little bit before. So they were always told that um, Oliver Lewis was the very first Derby winner was actually the model for the early slash original molds for these statues. Um, I mean, what can we say to kind of confirm or, you know, refute this assertion? You said the earliest Derby was 1872. Uh, uh, somebody said that, is that right? 75. 75, well, these are before that. <laughs> so there you have it. So we have no kind of um, information that Oliver Lewis at any point was a model for any of these? No. And is there any significance to the clothing worn by the 1920s Jocko? Jocko? Jocko Graves, which is um, the D image at the very end. It doesn't really look like racing cl clothing to me, but I, that is a question for somebody else. They didn't, yeah, they don't look like racing clothes to me either. Mm -hmm. Maybe the hat, but not the, uh, not the other parts. What I, I did come across um, some examples of uh, where in 
in this version where there's a different head on it, literally with a different type of hat. So oh. there, that the design was more of a, a servant as opposed to a jockey. And I think that this hat was, this head was literally attached to a different mold mm. body. Um, and do we know anything about the famous iron jockeys at the entrance to the 21 club in New York and what's happened to them since the 21 club has closed? I've not been to New York City since the pandemic, so I don't know if they're actually, I, I, I imagine they're still there. If anyone has seen them recently, can you drop into the chat if you know if they're there or not? <laughs> well, one, one thing that I have always found interesting is that uh, the first time I saw the, the statues on the 21 Club, there was one of the figures of, uh, I, in fact, I think there were two, two of the Darky Sambo figures. And then uh, more recently, those statues disappeared and were replaced with the jockey figures. Tim, or maybe, or just maybe they just jockey. moved around. Sorry, Carol. Um, thank you to Tim, who just said that the jockeys at the 21 Club are still there. Oh, oh. he does know. And then we have time for one last question. Um, and this is kind of a bit of a broader question. So how should businesses or homes who have these items what should they do with them? Should, if they're going to keep them out, should they put interpretive panels? Like, is it welcoming or not welcoming to have them? And is there a difference if they're painted uh, black, brown, or white faces? Claudia, I'm going to start with you on that one. We, we obviously are in the realm of um, public discourse and us as uh, cultural entities where I'm profoundly concerned with what we do institutionally. It, it, I understand the sporting collectors who have this connection to the history that is the sporting history relating to them. And it is, it's difficult for me as someone who is uh, tasked with the role of interpreting sporting culture to the broader community to place any restrictions um, in the broader context of that. And because it's, it's my role to, to make it understandable. Uh, I think Dr. Goings is probably more equipped to do a broader picture public collections answer with this one. I would still say what I'd said, uh, said earlier. I would think, I think they should donate them to uh, uh, a museum, a public museum, a uh, public library, historical center if they will accept them. Um, and I think they, they are representative of, um, of, Amer of American history. I, I, I know when I go past someone's home and, and see one, even ones, <clears throat> excuse me, that are painted white, does, it doesn't make that much difference to me if they're painted white. I, I still know uh, their history and white faces in this, in this case does not uh, does not erase that history for me. And I think for a lot of African Americans. Thank you. Anyone have any last minute comments they'd like to make before we end this program? Okay. Thank you guys so much for being here. This program has been recorded. Um, it'll take us about a week to get it up and we're gonna do it on a YouTube private link. And so please look out for that in your email. And if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to go ahead and send them to our email box and we'll pass them along. Thank you all so much for joining us. Okay, thank you, it was enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.